This presentation is, covers premarital and postmarital agreements. At the onset, I want to note that I've included two um, authors in this so that you know that we're using both of our, our textbooks for this presentation. The first one is Keene's book, Florida Divorce Handbook, and that's chapter chapter 14. And in the Lupino and Miller textbook, it's chapter 3. So I've woven in both the, the Keene book and the Lupino Miller book uh, in order to kind of make some overall um, sense of this without doing two separate presentations. First, some terminology that's important to uh, this area. Prenuptial agreements, they're also called premarital agreements or possibly anti-nuptial agreement or contracts. And uh, just a quick little fun thing, fun note, fun fact, my grandfather, years, years ago, obviously, um, remarried and his second marriage was to a woman who was married and they, they made such an agreement before they got married. His uh, bride-to-be was, was pretty wealthy and had a lot of family um, asset that she wanted to keep in her family for her own children. And he called it the anti-Neptunal agreement. I just think that is, I still laugh whenever I read anti-nuptial anti agreement. I think of anti-Neptunal. Uh, a post-nuptial agreement is uh, made after marriage and basically pre-nup, post-nup, that's kind of terminology I use and other, people's use, other people use. And as Keene notes in his textbook, he technically refers to a post-nuptial agreement as a settlement agreement. I don't want to disagree too much, but I do think that people do get, as we'll see later in the slide presentation, that people do, um, after the fact, realize they need to make an agreement after their marriage that they didn't anticipate having to make. And uh, also the term unconscionable, and uh, it comes up a few times in the slides to, to come. And basically, on a very general level, it means an unfair, unfair outcome, leading the court to refuse to enforce it, it being a contract. And public policy. Public policy is important to the family law area. Uh, some, the way it, just in simple terms, it means the rightness or the wrongness of certain behaviors that are held undesirable by the public. So it's not necessarily, it isn't something that's necessarily written in a book as undesirable, but the public finds it undesirable. So the nature of uh, all nuptial agreements are contracts, and they are enforceable just as any other contract, if they're valid. And they are also subject to formalities. Keene, in his Florida Divorce Handbook, comments that they are different from most contracts in that they do not require consideration. However, other authors such as Lupino Miller and many others, they would disagree with Keene and say that the consideration is the marriage itself. I'm not picking apart Keene's comment. I'm sure at some level of legal analysis that he may be right, but I'll defer to the majority of commentary that says it's the marriage itself that is the consideration. And uh, there'll be a few more details on this later in this lecture. What's important here is that what two people, uh, when two people marry, they accept the social contract in their state with all of its nuances. The contract of married persons comes with it. With that comes the rules of common law, statutes, and the cases that interpret and apply common law and statutes. The nature of a premarital agreement is to personalize the marital contract governed by these laws to fit their particular needs. In other words, they want to circumvent the normal laws of marriage and the marital contract, the social marital contract, and make their own agreements to the extent that's, that is permitted by law. Simply put, the couple who enters into a premarital agreement wants something different to happen than what the laws of death and divorce would otherwise provide to them. So intent enforceable contract, social contract of marriage to, social, to circumvent that social contract, um, agreements are made. 
Now remember, uh, in the earlier, in an earlier lecture of this course, we discussed the legal benefits of marriage. The legal benefits of marriage are very important in the areas of probate, or death, and divorce. As noted earlier, the objective of premarital agreements is to circumvent the social contract of marriage, which is generally the laws of marriage. In Florida, statutes govern what happens to an estate when a person dies. When a married person dies, the laws and the deceased person's will, if he or she has one, will govern how much of the estate will go to the surviving spouse. The laws provide special protections to spouses of deceased persons. An enforceable premarital agreement can facilitate something different from what the probate laws provide to the spouse. When married couples divorce, the laws of Florida will govern how a court will decide the property of the marriage is to be divided between them, and it also the laws also help the court determine if alimony should be paid to one of the spouses. An enforceable premarital agreement can facilitate something different from what the divorce laws provide for alimony and for the equitable distribution of the property um, if there is a divorce. In history, however, premarital agreements have not always been appreciated by the courts. The prevailing view was that premarital agreements facilitated divorce because they encouraged the spouse to position in the position of most of uh, to benefit the most, the wealthier person. Um, that person to benefit most from the contract and receiving the lion's share of the assets upon death or divorce would be able to, you know, there, there would be less effort to preserve the marital relationship. In other words, the the wealthier person wouldn't have any, um, would have, wouldn't have any, uh, with, a, with an agreement in place, wouldn't have any, um, would have less desire to preserve it if something went wrong in the marriage. The courts also wanted to protect women's interest in the years prior to the 70s when fewer women in America were working. So there was a risk then of leaving women destitute if there was a divorce or a death of the male spouse and they would be left to fend them for themselves on public assistance. But as we all know, this, the social institutions of America began to change, such as the advent of the women's liberation movement and no-fault divorce, and courts eventually did away with the legal presumptions that aimed to protect women in the legal system. The case of Posner versus Posner, um, it was a case decided in Florida in the Florida Supreme Court in 1970. The court held that premarital agreements were not invalid per se. So as noted on the previous slide, there was um, uh, initial frown, the, the courts initially frowned upon them, but Posner versus po Posner changed this and said that val valid agreements were not uh, by, by themselves, uh, inherently, as the, as the slide notes, um, invalid. And as such, this decision paved the way for family courts around the country to hold that premarital agreements are enforceable agreements that allow prospective spouses to enter into a marriage with more predictability if things didn't work out. Um, also know that at this time in history, Florida was a Posner versus Posner in the seven, in 1970, Florida was a common law prenuptial agreement state. Um, you know, except for some provisions that were set out in the probate code. Because remember, death and divorce are inherently those two areas that, uh, that under this, you know, the social contract without a, that that exists without a, an agreement. Um, the the prenuptial state being common law addressed the issues, and in probate code addressed the issues of the divorce upon death and survivorship rights. Um, the, the adoption after Posner, so Posner came along and we were a common law state in terms of the areas of prenuptial agreements, but then the Uniform Premarital Agreement Act was enacted by the Florida legislature after Posner. So now Florida is now a uniform, it has a uniform statement of the existing law instead of common law. We still have court cases that interpret um, what uh, that that look to cases involving uh, the UPAA, 
but we shift from a common law approach then to one that now this is defined by the legislature given what the legislature has defined and the facts here what is the legal analysis so that's what the court cases are doing since the UPAA was enacted by the legislature so the UPAA uh, was adopted in Florida and its uh, citation is here FLA stat section 61.079 and uh, of course I'm citing to the most recent um, uh, publication of it which was 2014. The UPAA cover governs all of these areas that can be addressed in a premarital agreement and the and Keene uh, the author of the Florida Divorce Handbook you know, he notes that um, the, the UPAA nor public policy allows the parties to agree to limit child support in any way um, but it doesn't prohibit them from expanding the support of a child, and it, and it, so it couldn't it, it, uh, so it couldn't say you never have to pay more than five hundred dollars per month for child support, but it could provide that you would pay for your child's education. Um, it also a, a premarital agreement could not provide for areas like time sharing, and the. Uh, um, areas that we're going to talk about more about that in a minute on the next slide but as you can see the UPAA and you should look up that statute it's very short you can print it if you want one page covers property property rights property transactions alimony um, excuse me the third bullet point was disposition of property then alimony wills trusts and other arrangements they were talking about probate or death benefits, um, death benefits under life insurance policies that would normally have some um, natural um, transfer of tile on, on someone's death or by um, as a matter of law. Um, and the choice of law for the agreement, that means that the person can, they can choose the law that applies to their agreement. Um, and then, like I said, any other matter not in violation of Florida's public policies or criminal law. And the child support and the, the examples of child support given by Keene and time sharing, for example, from Keene's book, would be example of the last point, any other matter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unenforceable provisions, as, uh, as the author Keene um, aptly notes, the UPAA doesn't let us, um, you know, contract away, as some people might say, the rights to or the amount of child support, etc. And this is based on the legal doctrine of parents patriae, which gives the states the rights to the right to determine the child's best interest. Um, and uh, and that's just how it is. We have laws that provide how much child support will be paid, the absolute minimum, and we have laws that decide if there will be time sharing and to what extent and how the um, public policy provide or how and how the laws of Florida provide for these areas. We can't contract them away. Uh, in addition, there are illegal or against public policy concerns of premarital agreements. In other words, a provision stating that the wife will agree to a menage a trois, you can look that up, <laughs> at least once a month would be deemed unenforceable or void as because it's against public policy. And remember from the terminology slide that was um, earlier in here, um, what public policy means. So Lupino and Miller expand the discussion of, you know, of Keene's notes about why we're not, the UPAA doesn't provide for an opportunity to contract away our um, certain things. And then we add also the public policy concerns. Contracts are governed by state law and the law of contracts is derived from common law principles. However, contracts of the premarital nature are in Florida governed by statute, the UPAA. Um, more, topic, uh, more of this topic comes along in a little bit. I'll discuss more on that topic and apply it to the Florida premarital agreements. Um, the, main, the main objective where it comes to a contract is to create a valid and legally enforceable agreement. For a premarital agreement, 
we're wanting to create a valid and legally in, legally enforceable agreement between married couple between a married couple that goes into effect when the marriage ends by divorce or the death of a spouse so let's look at a short lecture now on contracts and uh, I will be weaving in some of the points of law and factual information that uh, applies to contracts now an agreement is a contract must express the intent of the parties and so there must be in fact an agreement there has to be an offer and an acceptance um, obviously offer there has to be intent to create a legal obligation and that offer to another person must be definite and certain and then it also has to be communicated so three simple points about an offer then the person has to accept the the um, the offeree the person who receives the offer from the offer or must accept the offer and it's only made that that acceptance can only be given by the offeree or an agent of the offeree. It's uh, it must be an unconditional and identical um, acceptance. It has to be identical with the offer, and it has to be communicated with the offer. So Bill can't look at Sally and say, "Sally, let's go to the movies," and then Sally reply, um, "Yes, I'd like to go to the movies, but let's go to." Um, let's go to let's go bowling first uh, they don't have we don't have a, an offer and acceptance in a case like that another con two contract elements very important here um, enforceable contracts require the contract was made with what's called genuine assent and genuine assent is a complete agreement between two competent parties a party who demonstrates that he or she did not genuinely assent to the terms of a contract may void the contract and how do we um, void a contract how do we ask the court to find there was no genuine assent well it may be lacking due to fraud duress undue influence or a serious mistake contracts lacking genuine assent are voidable there is a lot of case law on the issue of genuous genuine assent in relation to prenuptial agreements Judges look for full disclosure of the assets of the person who has um, who has the you know the wealthy the wealthy person whose um, assets are being waived by the other person. The party waiving rights to assets of the other party needs to know what they are waiving, even if the disclosure is not entirely accurate or complete. And a general idea of the other party's finances is sufficient in Florida. Duress is determined by determining what pressure someone was experiencing. Keene, in his 2013 book, notes that the court looks to the totality of the circumstances. Mere stress over signing a, such an agreement is not sufficient. That rather is a natural, um, a naturalness, a natural duress. For example, an impending wedding date and having a premarital agreement sprung on the waiving party may be considered duress. But there's no magic cutoff date, like does it need to be more than a month before uh, the wedding that a premarital agreement gets sprung on the other party, or is two days enough, or whatever. Again, the court looks at how long the parties, um, how they look at um, how long the parties had discussed the possibility of a premarital agreement, how long before the wedding the first draft was presented, and the parties' uh, access to legal advice, and of course the, the appropriateness of the terms. If the terms are completely outrageous, but you had months to consider it, an attorney and, and an, and an in, in, independent attorney to advise you, and full financial disclosure, there is no reason it wouldn't be upheld, according to Keene in his 2013 book. Of course, competency of the parties entering into the contract is also imperative. A contract made with a child, an insane person, someone who is drunk or drugged or under legal disability is unenforceable. Case law is the source of law one would look to when researching this area, particularly where drunkenness is concerned. The facts of the situation would need to be carefully scrutinized against case law.
Suffice it to say that many contracts have been made in bars and written on a, con uh, on a cocktail napkin. More on the elements of contracts. The Uniform Premarital Agreement Act provides that premarital agreements must be in writing and signed by both parties. This is where what comes into play with what is meant when we say legal information. Forming a contract has to be legal and in, under the UPAA, in order to be enforced, a premarital agreement must be in writing and signed by both parties. This is pointed out in that statute I gave you the citation to earlier. Florida favors uh, nuptial agreements and there's nothing, there's a strong presumption that one would be enforced. An agreement, however, is unconscionable, as the slide notes, as far as the formation. Um, there, uh, if an agreement that is so unfair to one party um, may, as a matter of law, be considered unconscionable. An agreement that is so unfair to one party that the court will refuse to enforce it is an unconscionable contract. So if it's unenforceable, based upon unfairness, it is considered unconscionable. Where a contract promotes divorce or is entered into with intent to divorce, the court may find it is unconscionable as well under those circumstances. So the main idea here is formation, purpose, and performance. And the two major things that come into play for marriage contracts is it doesn't interfere with the marriage and it doesn't um, result in an unconscionable agreement. But let's add something about the fairness discussion. The outcome of a premarital agreement may be patently unfair simply because one party may be waiving all material rights uh, to all marital and all marital rights that would otherwise be available to that person had she he or she not waived them voluntarily. In Florida, as Keene in his 2013 book notes, disclosure of the assets being waived is a key factor the courts look to when an agreement has, an, has unconscionable results. If the victim of the unconscionable provisions was given full financial disclosure of the other party's assets, or voluntarily waived disclosure, or had or could have had an adequate knowledge of the other's finances, unconscionability doesn't matter. This is consistent with the long-standing rule that parties are free to make bad contracts as long as they know the facts and no one forces them to do so. Um, an example of a case where, um, I think it's a Florida case, and uh, I can't remember the parties, but you know it's, it's possible that a person can know, just by knowing a person for a long period of time, what their assets might be. And when it comes to this fairness piece uh, and looking at whether or not there was um, there was adequate disclosure, uh, the woman um, tried to uh, find, ask, ask the court to find the, the contract unconscionable, saying that she didn't have adequate disclosure. However, she the court uh, found that she knew the man for a long period of time. She also, had, during that period of time, had opportunity to know that he was a, a very busy uh, person, very busy business owner, and um, that there was, you know, essentially no way that she could not have figured that out as a as a uh, adult person with a, a good. Uh, it doesn't take much intuition, in other words, to figure that out on your own. So the court found that the contract was. Um, was perfectly valid. All right, more coming up on contracts and elements. Um, another part of uh, contracts and the elements required to, for contracts is they have to be consider con supported by consideration. Uh, so first of all, what is consideration? Consideration is anything exchanged for something else, and it is essential to make most contracts enforceable. Bare promises without any consideration from the promisee are unenforceable under law. Consideration does not usually need to have any financial value to make a contract in enforceable. For premarital agreements, the consideration is the marriage itself, not the promise to marry. This is why a premarital agreement is only enforceable if the parties get married, 
not if they enter into the agreement planning a marriage and since they've promised to marry um, and have a premarital agreement uh, and they don't marry one cannot enforce the agreement based on the premise that one party promised to marry and the other marry the other person and then didn't hope that makes sense um, the uh, the, when it's supported by consideration, it consists of a return promise, an act performed, and a forbearance. And uh, it must be lawful. The consideration must be lawful. <coughs> uh, and it required um, conduct not already required. And it has to be definite. So it has to be clearly defined. Contract elements also include, uh, it must be in a form required by law, which I already talked about. The Uniform Premarital Agreement Act in Florida requires premarital agreements be in writing and signed by both parties. So um, it has to observe the prescribed elements or the requirements of the UPAA. So premarital agreements become more, are, are very common anymore. Uh, they are primarily an asset protection vehicle. People that get married later in life and have substantial income and property want to get into uh, premarital agreements, remember, because they want to have a contract that, that provides an outcome different from what the laws provide uh, upon death or divorce. Second and second or more, like third, third or even more marriages with a uh, you know, second marriage or third marriages and divorced and remarriages. Remarriage is a better word. With children that have children and they want to support them and they have multiple support orders, um, you know, sometimes to protect those support orders for those children, uh, people will have premarital agreements. Late in life marriages, people who want to protect their children's inheritances will also um, go to the premarital agreement stage uh, to, to again, Make sure they preserve assets, asset protection vehicle. Drafting a premarital agreement is uh, governed by state law. It differs from state to state. In Florida, you would look at the UPAA. Um, determining the intent of the parties, this is the, the uh, negotiation stage that uh, the attorney is involved in. So when a client hires a lawyer to help them with a premarital agreement, the lawyer will look to the state law in Florida. They'll look to the UPAA, and they'll determine the intent of the party of the two parties. You know, the, they may require some negotiations between them, and it might require multiple drafts, as in writing more than one draft of the same document. Um, quoting from the Keene 2013 book, he says, "Because of their great importance, nuptial agreements must be carefully thought out, detailed, and well written." Often a great deal of money is at stake and even small mistakes can put the agreement at risk. You do not have the background, experience, or expertise to draft your own prenuptial agreement. And he's referring to the reader of the book. Um, most marital attorneys don't have the background either. You need to retain an attorney who does them somewhat regularly. Uh, that's really important and, and one of the reasons why I brought that up too is that uh, the area of premarital agreements, my experiences have been that the attorney spends a lot of time on them, working on them himself or herself. Um, I have some uh, pieces here and there to tell you about that the paralegal gets involved in later on. But the drafting of the document usually starts from a, a template that the, the attorney likes to use and um, the paralegal is involved in modifying the template. But it, for the most part, attorneys are very hands-on with premarital agreements. Next, uh, as far as drafting a premarital agreement, um, as pointed out earlier, it has to be in writing and signed by both parties. And uh, Keen, on the second point, notes that in his 2013 book, writes about the importance of getting attorneys involved in the premarital agreement particularly, and, and what he means is getting them involved as in so that both sides have an attorney. Particularly when the waiving party does not get an attorney, that can be really problematic. 
This point goes toward the concept that the waiving party must have adequate understanding of the rights he or she would have had had the agreement not been signed, the nature of the rights waived, and even the overall effect of the agreement. There is a rule of thumb, according to Keene, if a person has an attorney or was encouraged to have one and declined, that person will be bound by the agreement. The attorney for the wealthier party Keen suggests, should always encourage the other to be represented. It's hard for the court to question the validity of an agreement when an attorney was involved or one was never consulted, given the opportunity to do so. So again, what he's saying there in that quotation that I just read to you is that both parties need to have an attorney, and the waiving party that tries to dispute the um, you know, find invalid a premarital agreement later on um, at, a at a time of divorce or when the spouse that they waive the right, the, the property of dies, it can be very difficult. Um, if that person was uh, told, get an attorney, 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 um, and they didn't, or they don't take the attorney's advice. They go ahead and get an attorney. They don't take the attorney's advice and uh, sign it anyway. In uh, drafting they, the Lupino and Miller book, here's an example of an extremely simplified sample premarital agreement. This is really, really simple. Really, really simple. The premarital agreements I've seen have been pages long. I mean, many pages. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a much more complex situation than this. However, I mean, for the purpose of this course and an introduction to the concept, it, it's um, a good example in terms of that. Um, you know, the parties are contemplating a legal marriage, it says, and it notes the state that they're getting married, that their desire, you know, whereas, we, that's a legal thing we do, whereas it is their mutual desire to enter into this agreement and this will regulate their relationship toward each other with respect to the property, etc. And these are the agreements. One, you know, two, three, four, and five listed right there with the date and uh, a place for both of them to sign. The um, Before an attorney can prepare a premarital agreement, the attorney needs to know everything about the finances of, his or, of the client. These items will help the attorney identify the potential of the property distribution if there is a divorce or a death. So the point is that the, the attorney is looking at, we want to keep all of this, and for my client, for example, let's say the attorney works for the client who is wealthy and wants to make sure the second wife or whatever doesn't get everything when he dies or if they get a divorce. Um, so the, the attorney is doing a future look. They're looking at what could happen and what could happen if this man and woman get married and divorce and don't have a premarital agreement or what could happen if this couple get married and divorce and the, my client dies before the spouse and so they need to look at all the information that um, tells them what are the assets. And they look at it from the lens of death and divorce. The court in a divorce would say, this is what happens. The statutes provide for equitable distribution of property, equitable distribution of debt in a, in a, um, in a death. The court would say, well, the spouse has a, a legal right to 30% of the, of the estate called the spousal share. And if they own property that's homestead property or he owns property, the wealthier client owns property that he has homesteaded, the wife could have a life estate in that property. So there are two really big areas of law and the what could happen thing to, in order that keep this from um, that the attorney is going to look at, and they're going to need all this information to do so. Paralegals often help in this stage. They're often in the role of helping the client gather the information. Um, they'll organize it and catalog it for the attorney. Often preparing a list or a spreadsheet of all of these items and their value for purposes of financial disclosure to the to the party that's going to sign the agreement and waive all those assets.
All right, enforceability of the agreement. Now remember, reflecting back the contract, the elements of the contract, agreement, genuine assent, between competent parties, legal information, supported by consideration, and in the format re form required by law. If questions arise about the enforceability, um, remember that you know you you could be helping an attorney who's helping to a client to enforce or defend the the agreement, or that you could be helping the attorney who is representing the party who is opposing enforcement of it. In other words wish I hadn't signed, I was under duress, I, you know, I was about to get married in two minutes, I was, we were at the, we were at the, at the cruise ship, and, and all of my family was sitting there, uh, waiting to see us get married, and he springs this, um, agreement on me, and I'm supposed to sign it before I get married, blah, 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 so it depends, you know, there are two different, um, types of clients that attorneys help. The first inquiry, though, is, you know, was the agreement sound at inception? And these three points, full disclosure, opportunity to consult with a attorney, and it's not unconscionable. Those are the three main um, inquiries that an attorney will begin with when um, he or she begins to work with a client in these areas. And so the second glance doctrine comes about. Unforeseen changes can affect the enforceability of the premarital agreement. For example, a person could waive all property and alimony upon divorce or death. But what if that person was perfectly healthy when, when the agreement was signed and then later acquired a deadly or debilitating disease that made him or her crippled or and unable to take care of any of this, his own self-care. Now this person, the same person who signed that agreement and everything was fine that day, may not have the finances to afford the care needed. And so the court looks to this kind of, and the second glance doctrine, looks to changes, unforeseen changes in circumstances. So it's time to enforce the contract because the spouse wants a divorce or there's a or the spouse dies, and the spouse who's disabled, um, you know, can't care for himself or herself. Um, maybe the person is is not as uh, doesn't have the intellectual or business savvy that the uh, wealthier person had and can't take care of himself. The financial status, maybe they have, um, maybe she, the the dis, the person who survives has um, a lot of dependent children and can't and can't be expected to you know maybe it was octo mom or something isn't that and I'm just saying that as an example um, and uh, now she has so many children you know that premarital agreement she signed doesn't work because she can't care for the kids by you know she has eight kids the daycare alone drive you drive you to the bankruptcy court so, and what is the current standard of living? Not so much in Florida, they look at that, but it's in the book on um, looking at um, current versus past. But these are unforeseen changes. Second glance doctrine as in, this is what, it looked, looked really good when they signed it, but later on, wow, this person's in a completely different place. And it's negative where the person is now. And since it's negative, we want to make sure that this person who's left in this position isn't going to be, um, you know, on public assistance, for example. Finally, a couple of points about post-marital agreements. Um, they're also called post-nuptial agreements. These are traditionally contracts between a husband and a wife during the marriage, and uh, the, traditionally they were not enforceable. And this was stemmed from the common law concept of merged legal entity. You know, don't don't lose much sleep over that. It's just some legal theory to make you feel smart. Um, as noted by Keane in his book, there are two types of agreements: prenuptial agreement and postnuptial agreement. And the only difference between the two is when the parties make them. And um, the idea of disclosure comes up as a difference because there are differences in, in, in financial disclosure, pre-nup, post-nup. I won't go into that a lot. It's not necessary to. Um, and Keen tries to write about it, but sometimes he gets a little bit too vague. And so it, it's, it's, not, it's not 
investment of our time for this. Um, Lupino and Miller in their 2014 book, they classify postnuptial a little bit differently than Keen does. And so the next slides and this slide really come from the Lupino book. So reasons for a postnuptial agreement make sense, an afterthought. I didn't think about it prior to marriage, but now I had time to think about it. Or sometimes there are financial conflicts that parties need to resolve. Um, substantial change in circumstances. Uh, premarital expectations have proven incorrect. Inheritances, new assets, one party gets wealthy or has the potential of being wealthy or um, acquires a business of great asset or a great value. Uh, so there are reasons to get involved in postnuptial agreements. People do do it and they do do it in Florida. People, um, Keen, however, in his book refers to them as settlement agreements more or less, that they're really people heading toward divorce anyway. Not so sure I believe that, but that's okay. Why well, would call that a settlement agreement, not a postnuptial agreement? Um, I lean a little bit more on the side of Lupino and Miller where this discussion of postnuptial agreements comes about. Uh, so what about a postnuptial agreement? Um, this case of Anson versus Anson, we're looking at, is this a reasonable postnuptial agreement? And in this case, the husband sought to enforce the contract entered into after marriage. So it was a postnuptial agreement. And it was also made two years before he filed for divorce. So the wife claimed that post-marital agreement should be void due to public due, due to the fact that they are against public policy. Hers and her case was innately coercive, not at arm's length bargaining. Maybe he was more he was very wealthy and she was not. Um, uh, that she was he was more um, intelligence level than she was, and apt to encourage divorce. So she made those arguments. And from that case, that court, now remember, fair and reasonable, this is something that involves another state. So ours could be a little bit different. And you can look that up. You could, you could run a Google search, fair and reasonable and uh, premarital or postmarital post contracts in Florida and see what you find. Of course, look for reliable sources that are current, written by authors that know the answer. Um, but basically, these, each party has opportunities to obtain advice. There's no fraud or coercion. The assets were disclosed. Each spouse understood the waiver, you know, what would happen if there was a divorce. That's what judicial reckoning. Um, uh, the terms were fair and reasonable at the time of the agreement, at the time of the divorce. Now, there's a lot of similarity here between prenup and postnup. So, you know, wouldn't, um, it's just, you know, it's important to see that that there is a lot of similarity. Why? Because they're both founded on contract law. And that's why. So know your contract law and you will, you will succeed. And then understand probate and um, as best you can how property uh, is, is uh, distributed on probate and in divorce. And those three areas of law are being juggled at the same time when you're uh, working in uh, premarital and postmarital agreements. These are the references, of course, I showed you on the second slide before. Here they are again, so that I am not violating any copyright and not plagiarizing. All right? Thanks.